how we do this, we are the truest, got these fangs super sharp, your shit toothless, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish, in the graveyard, acting foolish, finna dance with the devil to no music, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of a podcast I like to call Ghoulish. And I am Max Booth, an undead host. Undead, you ask? How could that be? I'm glad you asked. Uh, well, I died. I was poisoned. I was assassinated with a poison egg all the way back in episode 100, 27 episodes ago. I was killed and then reanimated. I was revived into this ghoulish uh, host that you will listen to now. Not much has really changed since then. I'm still doing the podcast. And I'm still trying to figure out how to survive as a an undead human being. But, you know, the podcast has to go on, right? I can't just stop doing the podcast. The podcast is the whole reason I... I get up in the morning, even though I can't sleep now as I am undead, but I do still lay in a bed for six to eight hours every night, just looking at the ceiling and thinking uh, my deep, dark thoughts. (laughs) Um, Today I'm talking to Kathy Koja, who wrote possibly my favorite novel of all time, The Cyphel. And Bad Brains, both of those books rule. Now she has a new book coming out called Dilk Factually. But it's not just a book. It's also a website. It's a complete immersive experience. Feel a unique project, this experiment that she's doing. If you want to know more about what the hell I'm talking about, well, buckle up, folks, because (laughs) that's what we're discussing in the episode. She explains everything that you might want to know about concerning Dilk Factually and immersive fiction. She even is teaching a class next week over at Lick Reactal about immersive fiction. So if you were interested in taking a class with the great Kathy Koja, now's the time. And guess what? I got the hookup, folks. I reached out to Lick Reactal and I said, hey, I'm about to drop this episode with Kathy about immersive fiction. So why don't you give me a discount code that I could tell my listeners in case they were interested in in signing up? And at first they said, absolutely not. But then I said, please. And then they said, well, I'll get back to you. And uh, a day passed and they emailed me a discount code. I was as shocked as you might be. So if you go on over to litreactal.com and go over to the classes section and maneuver down to... uh, Kathy's immersive fiction class and if you sign up and use discount code koja10 k o j a 10 you i assume get 10 pills sent off they didn't specify but why else would that 10 be in the discount code if you will not get any 10 pills sent off so that's pretty cool right yeah now, before I let you go so you can listen to my conversation with Kathy, I do have a few announcements to uh, make because it's been a couple of weeks since I posted a new episode. And uh, reasons for that mostly boil down to lack of time because I, I, I recalled every episode myself. I edit, I produce, I release, I, I milk at them all myself. There's no big team with this podcast. It's just me frantically trying to uh, not die. Which is ironic, because I'm already dead. I also don't know if that's actually ironic. I don't know what irony means. Please don't tell me. But for those listening, uh, most of you probably know I operate a small publishing company called Pulpential Motion Machine Publishing with my pal, Noel Willie Michelle. We've operated this company for a decade now. We launched in... 2012 and now it's 2022 and somehow we haven't uh, thrown in the towel yet i don't know why either in fact we 
just launched a new imprint because I'm convinced a lot of people uh, are kind of thrown off by the name Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. It's not a name. I think it's the best, especially when we publish uh, spooky books. So going forward in 2022, any, uh, any spooky, scary book that we publish will now be released and know the, the spooky imprint of PMMP, which is called, you know, get this, folks. It's called Ghoulish Books, just like the podcast, except I've added the word books at the end. We already announced the, the lineup for 2022 as well, the Ghoulish Books lineup, which I will proceed to tell you. So first up, we have Below by Lil Hightower. That's kind of a Mothman creature feature novella. Then we have a book of my own, my new novel, Maggot Screaming. I will be releasing that through Ghoulish Books, as well as uh, John C. Fostel's new book, which is called Leech, and C.S. Humboldt's new book, All These Subtle Deceits. We will also release two books by Jessica McHugh, Rabbits in the Garden and Hills in the Hedgerow. We will reprint Cody Goodfellow's novel, Perfect Union. I don't think that book's been in print for like a decade, so good timing with us. And we will be releasing Betty Rocksteady's new book, Soft Places, which is a novella slash graphic novel hybrid. Really exciting stuff. And you could buy all those by going to ghoulishbooks.com. You could pre order them. But we do have something kind of exciting available right now that's not going to always be available. And that is the Ghoulish Books memberships. Basically, if you pay one upfront fee, you will pre order all eight of these books ahead of time and they will be shipped to you as they become available throughout the year. And you will also get a bunch of exclusive bonuses like uh, stickles and buttons and mugs and tote bags and memnalship cards that have been laminated and they have discount codes on them. And you can get that uh, memnalship over at ghoulishbooks.com as well. So one-time fee, you pre-order all eight of these books at a 10% discount too. You get 10% off all the books when you uh, buy them all in this lump this bundle, this membership subscription. And that's only available, the, uh, the subscription, until Valentine's Day. So February 14th is when you can no longer buy a subscription. So get on that. Ghoulishbooks.com. Really exciting. I'm excited. I'm also sick of doing this intro. So why don't we just get on to the episode? You click this podcast because you want to listen to Kathy Koja talk about immersive fiction. And that's what I'm going to give you. And don't forget, if you want to take whole class, use discount code KOJA10 over at LitReactal. That discount code will be good until the class begins next week, the 3rd, February 3rd. It's a Thursday, I believe. So you have just over a week to sign up. I recommend it. She's great. She's one of the best writers uh, I know. She knows all shit. Anyway, let's uh, let's talk about immersive fiction. Yeah, yeah. I think we have to begin this conversation by me asking you, what is immersive fiction? Well, immersive fiction is a way to talk about not only the way we read, but the way we write as well. And it's a way of using every tool available to us as we'll, we'll start with writing because I'm, I'm doing a lit reactor class coming up and I've just gone through my lectures for it. So the, my teacher hat is pretty firmly on my head. Um, the idea is to use all the sense tools available to us. Um, saying he drank coffee is different from saying he drank cold coffee from a chipped mug. The, the second way obviously gives you more of a feeling for what's happening, more of a feeling for the character and where that character might be. 
And all those sense details are available to us all the time. Whatever sense apparatus we have working in the world, it's giving us everything that we can take in. So using that in your writing makes the brings the reader more deeply into the world and and creates the world more strongly. So if you take a step further from that and you say, what other tools are available to make narrative more immersive? And with and I use Dark Factory as an example because that's my my latest experiment in in immersive fiction, a new novel that's coming out in May of this year. And the publisher and I talked about how do we how do we open up this experience for the reader even before the, the book, the edition of the book comes out. Okay, even before the ebook, before the print book, whatever. How do we open this up? And we started thinking about ways to use to open the story in such a way that people can start getting pieces of it and glimpses of it the way you do with anything large in real life. You don't see the whole thing at once. You see little bits of it. And then you know your interest is peaked or you say, that seems fun. I want to know more about it. So we started, we created a site, darkfactory.club. And there, three of the characters and I post every day uh, about some aspect of the Dark Factory world. And as it expands, there will be content from, there will be fan art. There will be content from other creators as it gets bigger and bigger. And the whole idea is to just keep making the immersion deeper so you can't, and you maybe don't want to know where the, you know, quote, real and real world ends and the dark factory world begins. So that's a very long answer, but it's, it has all, all the moving parts in it. It's a good answer because it introduces the website as well, which is something we have to talk about because I've been going over it all day long and it's fascinating. I will admit, like, in the beginning when you sent me the book and I had to, like, I'm going to read this and go through the website, I didn't know a lot about what this was initially. So I'm going through the website thinking, who the hell are all these people? And then I realized, oh, okay, they'll kill it till from the book. But that emulsive, like, element, it got me immediately because I was thinking right. – you know, it's like, oh, this is – she's she's wrangled together all these, these, all these people to help with the website – but then as I began going through the book, it became really obvious that I was just duped. But you're not duped. What you are is immersed. And actually, the, the many of the people and more all the time who are interviewed by the journalist character, Marfa Carpenter, are real people. They are actual people alive in the world that you can Google and find them. And I had some interesting exchanges with people saying, wait a minute, do you mean like Danielle Meyer is a real person? It's like, absolutely, she's a real person. She teaches at DePaul. And, oh, this guy is an editor of like an arts and entertainment paper in Memphis? Yes, he's real too. And so there are, are people existing in more than one plane of reality all across the Dutch country. So the, av the avatars you have on the website, where do they come from for some of the uh, people on the team? The people on the team are all people in the book right. and me, and they they are the the people behind and and populating the dark factory world. So, I mean the uh, the photos specifically you have like on the meet the team. Where do they come from? Oh well, I I can't possibly tell you that. I don't have... <laughs> I don't have their permission signed, so I could not possibly say. <laughs> okay, that, that's okay. So the website idea came after the book. Was the book already written by then? Or were you still writing the novel when you decided, oh, we should also get a website going as I continue to write the novel? What was really interesting and really maddening about this process, I've been writing books for a very long time, and I have a process in place that, works pretty well and that completely blew up when I was working on this because I was making something it was like trying to assemble Lego in the dark right you know that you're making something but you don't know what it is and if you can't if you don't know where the light switch is and you can't find it and you're continuing to make it's 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 very interesting, but it's also very confusing. And I, I knew that there were all these disparate elements that made up this book. There 
was art, there was music, there was the narrative itself, and all these interviews were part of it somehow, but I didn't have an idea of what it was as an entity until I got further into it. So I was flying blind for a long time, just kind of trusting that this process was going to bring something to life. And it was a ride. It was quite a ride. You know, it's not too surprising looking back now, like the some of the elements of this book, because it feels like a culmination of like what you were writing with the Seifel and Bad Brains, like oh, both of those book books, they feature similar elements and similar uh, scenes. So you have the the um, the music scene going on. You have the the painting, the panels, all of these like m almost misfits banding together to create this outside scene. I want to say, and you have that. I mean, that's all of what Dark Factory is. I want to think that I am taking that idea even a step farther and trying to open it up to say all these things that are happening and all these cool things that are happening at this dance club, the idea really blows up once they take it or it emerges from the club into, you know, the real world, the big world, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I think one of the things that really drives me crazy is when people talk about creativity as if it's confined only to the making of, you know, what we commonly call art. It's like, oh, I'm not creative. I can't do that. It's like, no, it, it is part of being a human being to be creative, period. I don't care in what way it comes out of you, but you are definitely creative. And one of the most creative people I have ever met was, she's recently retired, but she was a nurse for years and years. And I had never met anyone whose mind was so alive to how am I going to make this day happened for my patients. What can I do to help them? How can I change things? What can I do? That's being intensely creative. And I think we all have that. I know we all have that. I would agree. I think the only way humans have survived is through creativity. I mean, look at back, look back at like caveman days. Oh no, I'm cold. What am I going to do? I'm going to get creative. I'm going to get some stones and create some, some flames. And now I'm milling. That takes a creative mindset, I would say. And it takes a certain trust in the process itself. Like, I don't know what's going to happen when I do this, but I'm going to try to put some things together. And it's also pleasurable. When you are making things, it takes you kind of out of your head and into, you know, that flow space. And it, it always feels good. I mean, it feels fun. The time goes by. And if you're a collaborative sort and you like to do it with other people, when everybody gets in that state, it's magic. And you don't know what's going to happen. And that's the most fun of all. Yeah, not knowing what's going to happen is the best. And I can, like, going through the website specifically and just and hearing how you have plans for even expanding, filled the line with the outside riddles coming in. I mean, I have no idea where that's going to lead, but I definitely want to find out. It's good. That means it's working. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Well, it is supposed to engage people. And I really would like to blow up that idea that only certain people can create or only certain people can. We do want to make, I'm not sure yet how it will be structured, but a, a way for people to be able to upload their own things, whether it's a piece of music that they wrote about Dark Factory or their own art, or if they want to do fan fiction or to make people to make sure that they are able to engage and create with us with this idea. It reminds me a bit of what happened with uh, Josh Mandelman's book that he uploaded online where people began just making music to go along with it. Right. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of precedent for this. If you will just let people, let people play and not be, I mean, there also is the, you know, the, the unhappy side of that where some people are like, oh, don't write fan fiction about my stuff. And, you know, I, I know. And that's like, oh, dear. No, that's that's not fun. If people care enough about your work to want to engage with it, that's a huge compliment. Absolutely. Happy. You know, so why would you not like that? So, yeah, I would. Trisha Reeks and I of Meerkat Press are figuring out what is the best way. Like right now we have the Dark Factory mask contest. And How's that going? 
It is going well. Some people are, we had, had done a fan art contest when Meerkat Press brought out the cipher a couple years ago. And people stunned me with the quality of their, not that I wasn't expecting quality, but these were like, wow, okay. So I'm excited to see what people, we have a downloadable mask template just to kind of give people the idea and say, you can make this out of, you know, cardstock paper if you want, or you can really do anything you want. The, the mask is supposed to signify play. So as long as it feels like play to you and you put some antlers on it, people can't see, but I'm making the antler sign on my head <laughs> because the, the idea of, of the antlered person figures very prominently in this book about the idea of, of Dionysus and you know the Minotaur and all kinds of, Horned creatures that are made to liberate our play, our serious, playful nature. So that's the whole idea of the mask contest. And Sophia Zakia Jewelry has made, is making a gorgeous prize. For, oh, good. She makes yes. great, great oh, stuff. She's the best. Sophia yeah. had made the little cipher hand, the Nicholas hand with the hole in it for the cipher fan art contest. So she's making something else for dark factory and it is super cool so oh that's great it is our first prize and then there are other prizes and and it it should be it should be as much fun it will be hard to judge i know i'm i don't look because i always say oh it's, but then you see all these good and you're like oh they're all good oh shit oh no oh i have to pick oh no oh no okay well let me think about it and that, that was the cipher contest was very hard. So I anticipate this one will be just as difficult, which is a great problem to have. Did you have to get some outside influence to kind of look at them to help you make your mind up? Or how was that judging no, process like? No, I took the, took the responsibility on myself. Said, so your name is on the book. You can judge the contest. And, and But it was really hard. It was, you know, after a certain point, you just have to kind of let the gods decide because when it's like being an editor with too many great stories for an anthology and going, Oh shit, what am I going to do now? Yeah. There's only room for so many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also know I've also been listening to some of the music on the website. Where is that coming from? It's, it's so fun. Some of it is a lot of those choices are made by Trisha Reeks and I can't give Trisha enough credit for not only is Meerkat Press, I love Meerkat. I, this is my third book with them, and I'm just over the moon happy. But when she talks about being, she had done an interview with Locus um, when her press first started pretty much and talked about wanting to really be a collaborative partner with her writers. And that is not bullshit. She really means it, and she will put in so much work and so much creativity and go more than the extra mile to make sure things are the way that we're both envisioning them. So, and in fact, Trisha and I will be doing the first launch event together in Atlanta in a recording studio that she has got set up for us. And so I, the plan now is we're gonna stream it on Twitch and invite people to be part of it from everywhere. Cause that, that's one of the, one of the kind of left-handed gifts that we got from COVID is that now people are much more familiar and, you know, everyone's used to streaming things. Everyone's used to attending things virtually. So I would hate to see that kind of go away in favor of, you know, in-person only events. It just seems like everyone knows how to do it now. You know, why wouldn't we want to do it that way? Yeah, and it's way more inclusive now. I mean, all like the fans of you who wouldn't be able to make that drive, now they can Sure. Be in attendance and that's great anyone can be there anyone can come people from you know from anywhere in the world will be invited and will be welcome to come and that just makes everything more fun the more people who can contribute and come and hang out and see the mass and I'm a, I'm not much of a of a club person. In fact, I've never been to a club and the idea terrifies me but this book is really claustrophobic at times in the scenes that take place at clubs. I'm wondering uh, how much experience do you have with that? I have gone to my share of clubs. All right. I have. I have yeah. gone to my share and 
I broke my foot on a dance floor, so I feel like I have I have cred. Um, I didn't know it was broken at the time. I just thought, ah, my foot hurts. And I just kept dancing. And then the next day I was like, oh, wow, my foot really hurts. I should probably <laughs> see somebody about this. And yeah, I think one of the one of the things that I like about the idea of a club is that it's it's inclusive, but it's not exclusive. You want everyone who could could vibe with it to come. You don't want to you know put up the clubs that put up the velvet ropes and don't want to let you in. Uh, you know that's that's not as much fun as the clubs that are like if you like what we're doing here, then you belong here. You should come here. And I think any any creative experience, not every book is going to be for everybody, yeah. right? Very, I mean, there there could be books that are for everybody. Maybe Dr. Seuss, you know, is for everybody. House not of all Leaves. Of them. Not all of them. Yeah, how's it? Well, House of Leaves, <laughs> right? It's like, and that's a great example because yeah. it's such a polarizing book in a lot of ways, right? Oh, yeah. The people who love it, love it. The, the cipher is like it. The people who like it, really like it. The people who don't, really don't. And people have, everyone has had the experience where your friend pushes a book on you and says, oh, man, you got to read this. And you start reading it and you go, mm, it's not for me. Oh, no. But some things really are for us. And anyone who has the receptors for Dark Factory is welcome to be part of the experience. That's That's kind of the point. And... If you don't, you don't. You know, no harm, no foul. If it's not the club for you, then that's cool. Well, I would be okay with with attending this club. This is one club I would be okay with. Good. Oh, <laughs> that is okay. That is a great poll quote. Max Booth says, "This is one club even I would go to." Okay, I would show up there. The only other club I've been to was a was a was a boys and girls club, and I was I was kicked out of it. We'll see. They see they soured your experience. Don't let them do that. Don't let them do that. No, 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 no club that would drive you out is worth having you. So poop on them. Oh, I, I'm not going to do that. Well, I'm glad that the that the the book is resonating with you and the story is resonating with you and that the whole experience, because the whole thing is really a it is an experiment. And Trisha and I have really tried our best to think of ways to be as inclusive as possible right? and make sure that people feel like even to, to explaining, well, what is it? What is immersive fiction? What is this about? You know, so people don't feel like, Oh, maybe this is like arty or it's not for me. People can't see my air quotes around arty, but I am making them like really hard. It's just another way to, to create a narrative. And I think that people we are so used to now jumping back and forth between things, right? If you watch something you really like, you get online and see what else is there about it, or you watch a trailer, then you watch the thing, then you go online and talk to other people, or you go on Reddit and you say, oh, you know, do you know about this or that? And that's just how we engage with stuff now. So it just seemed like a pretty natural fit. I think anyone who's not taking advantage of the internet, who's also writing books nowadays, or, or missing out on so many opportunities. I think of like when David Wong released uh, "John Dies at the End." Do, are you familiar with that book? Yeah. So when he, um, so David Wong, for anyone listening who doesn't know, he used to be like the main honcho at Crack dot com, and he would run the um, the uh, the Cracked films called Point Pointless Waste of Time, and when it was really popular. And one of the things he did when the book was coming out was he created this internet scavenger hunt. Well, he made like dozens of different websites and he hid secrets to like find things about the book before it came out. Like he had secrets inside the website's code. So you would have to like almost hack the site just to find the codes. It was really cool and it made everyone really immersive into the book and they will pump exactly. up and i think what you're doing is riding that same wavelength i think it's really smell and really fun and that and that's the magic word too because if people are having fun with it and they're having fun with each other too while they're doing this and sharing because we're so used to sharing everything we do now too that's more than half the fun right the first thing you do after you enjoy something is go oh my god i just did this you guys should do it too look and quick, I'm going to share a bunch of things with you or come and do it with me. Let's do it together. No, I agree. I think 
I don't know why we're not doing more of this. I mean, we are, this is how we live now. So why shouldn't be, this is how we read now. Why Absolutely. shouldn't it be that? What can you tell me about this launch in Atlanta that you have planned? The launch, there will be, there will be a bookstore component. Um, the launch itself will take place on May 10th at a studio in Atlanta. And Trisha and I, We'll be engaging with people live. We will be showing some video that folks have made for specifically for the book and some other possible surprise guests will join us in the studio. COVID permitting, everything has, you know, that umbrella over it. So we'll see what happens. But the idea is to make the, the launch of the book as much like a night in the club as possible. Let's just say we will be going to like the glitter store before <laughs> we <laughs> before we start this bitch up. But, Excellent. Yeah, the idea is to to try to feel as much like being at a club okay. during this launch as you can. Sounds great. How can folks find you online and how can they follow the website and everything going on with the Dylan Factory Experiment Project? They can go to darkfactory.club and start reading the content there because someone asked me, is this all like a big commercial? I'm like, no, dude, this is actually the book. This is part of the book, right? It's like, this is not a giant marketing campaign. This is, is stuff that as you read and as you're reading that, it will make even more sense once you've read the book because you'll know all these people already, right? There'll be, the characters will be people you already know. So go to... It's almost like it's almost like saying my left hand is a commercial for my right hand. Like, no, I need both of them together. Yes. Make, make me. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If I'm going to get anything done, I need both hands on the wheel. So people can go to darkfactory.club and start checking out the world there. They can follow darkfactory.club on Twitter and Instagram. They can follow me on Twitter and Facebook or and or Meerkat Press who is also everywhere and yeah, start getting immersed and think about being part of our mass contest and think about ways that you might want to engage with the project. Excellent. That's a great way to end the episode. I think. Thank you. All right. This was great. Good. I'm so glad that it's working too, because we really took a gamble that people would be able to, that they would want to engage with it. I mean, that's, you can make anything, but until you bring it to the table and start serving it, you don't know if anybody's going to like it. So Yeah, something I've been really grumpy about, and we can include this in the episode too, is the, the death of the website. Because once social media kind of be, took over mm -hmm. everything, websites began dying because everyone got all of the content and anything they read from the internet, mainly Facebook, like websites, like I mentioned it already, like crack.com, it pretty right. much died because everyone began getting anything they read from Facebook only. So they would have to change up how they even had a website and cross post everything to Facebook. And then, uh, and like halfway through, once Facebook became like the dominant source of material they began challenging websites money for anyone to even see what they were posting and websites just right. died because of that so like to see a new website launch that isn't social media and for people to be engaging with it still and going to it that's really cool and i we talked about that too and said how do we want we need to have you know you have to have some presence on facebook and you want to have presence on Instagram, you want to have a presence on Twitter, so people can find you there. Um, there's a book called, oh, what is it called? Song of Achilles, it's across the room from me. And the reason I found out that book existed is there's a Twitter account called Song of Achilles Bot, and they would just post little snippets from the book. And I don't even, I must have seen someone retweet it, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, and I started following it, and I thought, God, that's really good. I need to get after that. And so I bought the book and I love it. But it can be it can be a helpful gateway like that or a way to, you know, tell people, hey, this is something you might want to see. But I agree. I don't think all content also that means all content is controlled by an entity that's not you. And that I don't like. Yeah, an entity that can decide without explaining why that it's not appropriate and just ban you. 
Absolutely. No reason at all. So I think having a website like this is just like a genius move, and I hope it brings it back and makes websites more popular. That would be amazing. And then people realize that, that it's just another tool, and it's just another way to make sure that your art, your art is out there or you can connect with people. Right, because if you just let – if you only let the big players decide what's up there – I mean, we see that in publishing too, right? It's like – the big houses should not control all the content because then that means that a bunch of work will never get seen, will never get published, and we'll never know about it. So, yeah, that, that's not cool. I don't see any way a big house would ever, like, look with you on a, on a project like this. This is indie through and through, and that's why I love indie. No, 100%. They, even if, even if I could have communicated the desire to them enough for them to want to take it on. They're just too big. They're just too big and too kind of, uh, you know, they're like a big, one of those things in star Wars. I don't know the names of them. A uh, big those robot big, guy. Those, I don't know. Those big robot things that go boom, <laughs> boom, boom, walk across the landscape. And you're like, okay, that's like random house. There it goes. You know? Yeah. Okay, bye. And meanwhile, and, all the tiny little, Ewok creatures just running away trying not to get stomped on. <laughs> right. And meanwhile, the rest of us are like, oh, we're over here building like the spaceship that goes 5,000 miles an hour yeah. and it fits two people. Come on, get in. <laughs> right. That, that's the fun part. And that you can be, you can be more nimble and you can be more creative too because yeah. you don't have like a million layers of people ahead of you that you have to rubber stamp your idea and your plans and if trisha reeks wants to do something it's her press and she does it right so it's it's pretty cool i gotta say and this is why folks listening you should always support indie presses because we're doing things no one else is doing <laughs> and and trying things that no one else will try and being really fearless in a lot of ways there are so many i was a keynote um speaker for small fair last year in the new small fair this year, uh, Brian Evanson is the keynote, so that will be super cool. And the amount and the breadth of the presses involved blew my mind. There were like 160-some presses involved last year. And here are all these people doing all this cool work, and you're going, okay, this is like a cornucopia. The TBR pile you know, gets to the ceiling. You're like, I don't care. I don't care. I just want to read all these things. Because it's it's they are indie books, and they are – books that you know someone has curated. Look at what Lisa is doing at Clash Books. I love their line because you know that there's a curating mind behind it. Same with Trisha Reeks. There's a curating mind behind it, picking the, it's not just like, well, what are, what might people like two years from now? Let's do that. Yeah. We like in, in the presses as someone who also runs one, it's like, we don't, we don't need to think about that. I mean, we don't have that type of budget anyway to even be only about what an audience might think about two years from now. It's what is fun, what is interesting, and what is no one else really trying. Let's just throw the, the, the pasta at the wall and see what happens. And to be able to have that freedom to say, and the, the belief too in what you're doing to say, I really like this, and I think someone else will like it too. I mean, that's what's driven indie work for years, right? It's like, I like this enough to want to put my resources into getting it out there because I believe other people will like it too. And they do. You will find an audience. There's an audience. There's always an audience. Even if you have to dig a long time, you will find someone. You will. And you never know where those connections will take you or who is going to like what you do. And I know, you know that you have seen this as a publisher and I've seen it as a writer really surprising things happen when you really put your own things out there. And it's nice to have, it's nice, but it's not as necessary as it used to be back in the day to have all that resource behind you because we, because we do have the internet now and we are able to share things quickly and inexpensively to let people know what we're doing. It's not, like back in the day where you had to like mail out letters and cross your fingers and, you know, and, uh, you know, I, that's why I, I'm always amazed by people who are my age and they're like, Oh, things are better. Nothing was better than nothing was better than the only thing that was better was the climate. Okay. Right. Everything <laughs> else is better now. It's just, we have so many 
good ways to communicate and so many ways to share what we're doing, everything's better. I agree. And I think that's a good way to end the episode. All, All right. right. Everything's better. Let's go out and make fun things. Yes. Fight climate change. And also Nazis. Okay. Fight that. Oh, yeah. Fight all the Nazis. Fight just. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We. I know. We have a long to-do list. Don't we? we have a lot of things we do have to fight, actually. <laughs> fight climate change. Fight fascism. Fight racism. Fight the GOP. Make good art. Um, buy all the good coffee if that is the way you swing. And come to darkfactory.club. Okay. That's my that's that's it. final word. That's the, way, that's the one. All right. Thank you so much for coming on. This was a blast. And that was Kathy Koja talking about immersive fiction. Go pre the new book, Dark Factory. And sign up for the uh, immersive fiction class at Lit Reactor. Use discount code Koja10. Get a discount. Take a good class. Boom, from one of the best. And go on over to ghoulishbooks.com and pick up all eight books we have coming out this year, including my new novel, Maggot Screaming, a book about death. All right, that's all I got. Leave a review of the podcast, maybe, if you like it. I would love more reviews. It's okay if you don't. It just means you don't love me as much as I thought. Goodbye.